Linux is stealing all of my RAM. Linux is using too much RAM. I'm not doing anything. Where is all my RAM going? These are statements you'll every so often see on Linux question forums, on subreddits, and various other places that new Linux users might congregate to try and learn about what's going on on their system. But usually people having this problem aren't unknowingly running something weird in the background that's using a lot of RAM, or running some weird software that has an undiscovered memory leak where it's legitimately using way too much RAM. These are people running totally normal systems. They might have like a regular Fedora install available, or Pop OS, or Ubuntu, and they're not running anything weird. It's a relatively normal configuration. This is an observable problem that many users seem to be facing. And this is certainly not a new phenomena. Basically the entire time that regular people have been using Linux, there have been some people noticing that something is happening, but not entirely sure what's happening. If you ever see someone complaining about this issue, the very first thing you need to ask is why do you care? Maybe in a more friendly way, are you actually experiencing any performance issues? Are load times slowing down? Are you seeing stutters? Are you seeing processors just randomly being killed in the background and it's ruining your ability to use your system? Is anything negative actually happening? Or is what you are seeing number big? I don't like number big. Something must be going wrong, must fix number. Because if that is the problem, it might be what we're talking about today because in most situations, that is what the actual problem is. If nothing bad is happening on your system, if everything you want to do is working exactly like it should, we're not talking about your CPU temps being too high, which actually can cause legitimate damage, or CPU cores being pinned, which is legitimately going to slow things down, or anything else which could cause an actual problem. If it's just number too high, Stop worrying, because it's just as true today as it was in 2009. Linux ate my RAM. Don't panic, your RAM is fine. I absolutely adore this graphic, and I love just how badly edited it is as well. Like, you can see, it was just the mouth that was cut out to make that fit. There's a little bit here that was extra cut out more than it should be, but regardless, uh, <laughs> perfect. Look, it was good for 2009, it's even better today. So, what is going on. Like all modern operating systems, Linux is borrowing unused memory for disk caching. This makes it look like you are low on free memory, but you are not. Everything is fine. The more important question is why is this happening? Why can't I just have all of my RAM just available, free all of the time, and have as low number as I can possibly have? Disk caching makes the system much faster and more responsive. There are no downsides, except for confusing users who are new to computing and unfamiliar with the concept of a file system cache. It doesn't generally take memory away from applications. This is very important to remember. Now, Generally is also very important because things can go wrong, but most of the time, it's fine. And you just have to worry about it. Now, the reason why you want to cache things is also very simple. RAM, faster than storage. It's obviously a lot faster than a mechanical hard drive, but it's also faster than your SSD, your, your SATA SSD, your NVMe drives. RAM much faster. As a general high-level rule, and there are some side technologies that make this graph a little bit more confusing because they slot in in really weird places and move things around a bit, but generally, in the simplest case, from slowest to fastest, it goes drive, RAM, and then hardware embedded memory. So in the case of your CPU, that is your L1, L2, and L3 cache. Those also are different speeds as well. And then your GPU memory in the case of a GPU task. By simply loading commonly used elements into memory, it makes loading that another time considerably faster. Let's take this away from just our system and talk about the web and our web browser. So your browser also makes use of a cache. When you visit a website, the first time you go to it, the entire page is going to be downloaded 
over the network, that page is going to be saved, or at least in some form, is going to be saved in your browser cache. This is stored on your drive. Now, accessing your drive is considerably faster than accessing something over the network. So, when you go to that site one more time, instead of downloading the entire page again in its entirety, it is going to be partially loaded from your cache, and then the additional elements are going to be downloaded over the network. This load is going to be much faster than loading it the first time. Now, let's talk about our system. Let's say right now, you go and open up another instance of uh, Firefox, of Chromium, of any browser. Let's do it right here so you can actually see it. Almost instantly, that opens. What if you then go and reboot your system and then open a browser again? You're going to notice it takes a lot longer to open the browser the first time than it does any of the times after that. That is because you are now caching part of this into your system memory, making it much faster to load than loading it entirely from your drive. Another really good example of this is a bug that was present on KDE. We're opening up things like your alt tab or your tiling editor or the logout interface, uh, this one here, Every time you open those, rather than loading from your system memory, they will be loaded from your drive. So basic effects like this took way, way longer to load than they should be doing. And here is an example from the author. Keep in mind, this is based around 2009 computing speeds, so things are going to be considerably faster now, assuming you're not running a laptop from 2009. Let's make two test programs, one in Python, one in Java. Python and Java both come with pretty big runtimes, which have to be loaded in order to run the application. This is a perfect scenario for disk cache to work its magic. Both of these are very simple Hello World programs, one saying Hello World, love Python, the other one saying Hello World, World regards Java. Our Hello World apps work. Let's drop the disk cache and see how long it takes to run. So the Python one, one second. The Java one, 2.1 seconds. But that is only on the first run. Now all of the files required to run them will be in the disk cache so they can be fetched straight from memory. Trying it again gives you considerably faster speeds. 0.2 seconds and 0.1 seconds. And the important part is all of your apps get this boost automatically. This is just something that is done in the background that you don't have to think about. This is just done by the system. All of that is all well and good. We like faster applications, and if you have a lot of memory, this is always going to be something you really want. But what if I want to run more applications? If your applications want more memory, the kernel will just take back a chunk of the disk cache borrowed. Disk cache can always be given back to applications immediately. You are not low on RAM. Obviously, this is going to slow down things that were in the disk cache, but it is not going to slow down the applications that you actually want to run. So obviously, having more system memory means that things are going to be taken out of the disk cache a lot less often. But if you don't have that much of it, unless you are using legitimately too much memory, this is very unlikely going to be a problem. Like, sure, if you have a virtual machine and you have 8 gigs of memory and you've assigned it 7.5, yes, then you might start having problems. Do I need more swap? Probably not. Disk caching primarily borrows the RAM that applications don't currently want. If applications want more memory, the kernel will take it back from the disk cache. Linux can push application memory into swap if that memory is accessed less often than the file system cache. But this will typically improve performance, not hurt it. Now, there are some extreme cases where you may actually want some additional swap. But keep in mind that swap exists on your drive. It is not a replacement for extreme RAM usage issues in cases where you legitimately are using too much RAM. It is a band-aid and will make sure that you don't experience severe issues, but in that case, you are better off ensuring you have more RAM. But it is fairly important to have swap if you care about suspending your system. If you don't though, there's a lot of arguments that can be made where swap may not be super important anymore. But I have not listened to anything so far.
How do I stop Linux from doing this? You can't completely disable disk caching, but you can tune Linux's swappiness. This value basically tells Linux how aggressively it should move inactive memory pages from the system memory to swap on the disk. The higher the number, the more aggressive it is going to be, maxing out at 200 with zero, not meaning never, just avoid unless absolutely necessary. If you'd like to check your swappiness value, you can do so with this command right here, sudo sysctl vm.swappiness. Keep in mind, swappiness has two p's in it. In my case, it is set to five. I think I modified it at one point. I don't entirely recall. And if I did modify it, I don't remember why. The only reason anyone ever wants to disable disk caching is because they think it takes memory away from their applications, which it doesn't. Disk cache makes applications load faster and run smoother, but it never ever takes memory away from them. Therefore, there's absolutely no reason to disable it. If, however, you find yourself needing to clear some RAM quickly for some reason, like benchmarking the cold start of an uncached application, you can force Linux to non-destructively drop caches using this command right here. Now, I guess if you really don't care about system performance and you want number to be as low as possible, you could run this on like a timer where every 5, 10, 30 minutes, it automatically runs. Keep in mind that by doing that, you are going to massively degrade your performance for no reason at all besides having a lower number. Okay, if I actually have all of this RAM available, it's just being used up by the disk cache, why do top and free say that so little RAM is free if it is? This is just a difference in terminology. Both you and Linux agree that memory taken by applications is used, while memory that isn't used for anything is free. But how do you count memory that is currently used for something but can still be made available to applications? You might count that memory as free and or available. Linux instead counts it as available, which is a bit different from free. So available means it is in use by the cache, but it can be freed to be used by an application. The problem is these numbers are counted as two separate values, the free RAM and the available RAM. So if you don't know what these numbers mean, it can seem like the actual amount of RAM that is usable, we'll say, is a lot lower than it really is. So how do I see how much free RAM I actually have available? Well, the way we do this is running the free dash M command. Now keep in mind, this was originally written back in 2009. So in this case, there is uh, 792 bytes available. I am not going to get into the distinction of mebby and megabytes. Um, feel free to go to Wikipedia and look at those up yourself. Um, yeah, anyway, in my case, I have 32,009 mebibytes available in total, and currently available is 27,699. But if I just looked at the free column, this would look like considerably less memory. Now, a lot of modern applications do actually report things more sensibly. In the case of my fetch application, it is saying my used memory is actually my used memory is not trying to do any weird calculations it is only taking that specific number again used memory is memory actually being used by applications whereas this 19838 this is the memory being used in my buffer being used in my cache in the case of the author if you just looked at the free number it would only say that 13 mebibytes is available. 99% of the RAM is full. When in reality, it's only just 42%. So, when should you not worry? When free memory is close to zero. When the available memory, or free plus buffers slash cache, has enough room. Let's say 20% plus of total. When the swap used does not change. This is a healthy Linux system with more than enough memory showing completely harmless behavior. But 
there are cases where you actually should be worried. The available memory or free plus buffers slash cash is close to zero. The swap used increases or fluctuates. D message piped into grep oom killer shows the out of memory killer at work. This is going through and killing processes that basically don't need to run to make sure the system doesn't crash. A good example of an actual problem is on my cosmic stream where my entire system memory was full. My swap was using about 30 gigabytes and it kept going up and up and up. I was doing nothing on my desktop. The system started becoming very stuttery and that's because Cosmic at the time had a very serious memory leak. So uh, that was a problem. That was an actual problem where I was legitimately using too much RAM. But if you're in a case like mine where you have 20 gigabytes in your cache... Doesn't actually matter. But what do you think? Have you actually come across this post before? This is by no means a new post, and every so often it makes the rounds, and just this time it happened to make it in front of my feed. So um, let me know your thoughts down below. If you like the video, go like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, subscribe to the Verapay linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and... Oom. Um.